My guest this week was Franklin Taggart, a fellow consultant with the Larimer County Small Business Development Center and founder of Franklin Taggart Coaching. Franklin was the first podcaster to feature me on his show. My story of going from banker to food trucker to loco think tank guy was a great fit for his Reset podcast, and I've been blessed by dashes of his wisdom throughout our time together at Larimer SPDC. Franklin was a career musician back east for many years until health challenges made that journey difficult and then impossible. After and during a season of challenge, his skills as a coach and encourager sprouted and blossomed, and today Franklin serves a very special niche, creative solopreneurs looking to build sustainable enterprises that fit their talents and their lifestyles. This is a very inspiring and philosophical episode with someone I'd call a pragmatic dreamer, and he's got a smooth, velvety voice, so please enjoy my conversation with Franklin Tech. Let's have some fun. Welcome to the Loco Experience Podcast. On this show, you'll get to know business and community leaders from all around Northern Colorado and beyond. Our guests share their stories, business stories, life stories, stories of triumph and of tragedy, and through it all, you'll be inspired and entertained. These conversations are real and raw, and no topics are off limits. So pop in a breath mint and get ready to meet our latest guest. Welcome back to the Loco Experience Podcast. My guest today is Franklin Taggart. And uh, Franklin and I know each other from a few different routes, most notably the Small Business Development Center. Yeah. Um, and also Franklin was, I guess, one of my early inspirations into podcasting, having me on his show. Uh, I was, it was one of the first, at least one or two podcasts I was on. So yeah, thanks for that. That's been a few years now. It? it has. Yeah. yeah, quite a few. And why don't you go ahead and tell people what the Franklin is? Did you call yourself the Franklin? The Franklin. What the Franklin is all about. <laughs> you can start now if you want. We're recording this late on a Friday afternoon. The Franklin <laughs> works just fine. Right? Perfect. Um, what I am all about. Well, um, last year I retired from a 43 year career in music performance. Oh. Um, as a, as most musicians do, I had a long series of day jobs from the time I was pretty much old enough to work until now. Yeah. And so a lot of those day jobs have been things like I was a church music salesman. Okay. I was, I worked in recording studios. I did jingles. I, you know, I did all kinds of stuff like that. Whatever you could do <laughs> to, to make a buck, but still adjacent to the music business really sounds like. Exactly. Yeah. And this, for about eight years in there, I was doing social services. Like oh. I worked in a crisis center and I worked wow. in a group home and I worked in um, a, a domestic violence shelter and all of this stuff. And so I, my career path is just an absolute nightmare. We have some non-traditional for sure. <laughs> but my music career was interrupted in 2000, 2007. I started to get really sick. And I had had tendonitis for a couple of years before that, and I could not play the guitar without pain. And so I just had to put it aside. I had to, you know, music was not an option. Yeah. And um, I had been doing it full time at that point for, I don't know, about eight years. Okay. In the midst of all of that, um, I had a small son, two years old, and my wife was just starting a business of her own. She had started her business right after our son was born and uh, we're both self-employed people. Right. And so I felt the pressure I, without your, what's been your income source. Absolutely. Yeah, and man, it was gone. Yeah. It was and just her gone. baby needs her at maximum at that age. Yes. What business had she started? Well, my wife is just a brilliant chef and she's also a great teacher. And mm -hmm. so she started teaching a couple of, uh, different diets and uh, traditional cooking okay. techniques. Yeah. And she's still doing that today. It's, you know, almost like a chef and coach together yeah. almost. Teaching. Oh yeah. She's like, she's totally amazing Renaissance woman. Yeah. Anybody wants to find out about her, it's Monica Corrado is simply being well. <laughs> and Monica, Monica is I'm just, sure you'll uh, listen to this one. she's a brilliant, brilliant person, but she was in the midst of getting her own business off the ground. 
we had this two-year-old son and here I was, my organs were shutting down oh my gosh. and I was hospitalized over and oh over my. and over again over the next few years. Wow. And they couldn't figure out what was going on. Well, I went to a clinic at one point and the doctor said, you know, nobody's ever checked your thyroid. He, and this is like two years into the ordeal, right? I'm already a mess. And, and sure enough, it came back that my thyroid was mm. really, really out of mm. balance. It was yeah. like totally hyper, yeah. Yeah. hyper. And I had a thing called Graves disease. And when okay. they treated that, all of a sudden the symptoms started to subside. Mm. And very gradually over the next few years, the symptoms went away enough that I could continue to play music. But during that interim time, I mean, your son still wanted to eat the whole time. Oh yeah. That <laughs> guy. Yeah. Yeah. He was a hungry fellow. Still <laughs> is for that matter. But during that time I had to find ways to make money. And, um, it was, it was kind of like the early days of digital, um, digital products. Um, I did some eBooks. I did some online courses. There are still some videos that I'm horribly embarrassed about from my earliest online courses on teaching guitar and doing mm. home recording. Um, I blogged, I had 17 blogs, whoa, on different topics. And I, that were all you as a blogger writing about different topics. Cause writing was about the only thing that I could do. Why? And um, I started my first podcast during that time as well. And that was around. 2009, 2010. That was OG time. Like that's before well, Joe man. Rogan, right? Died up. Yeah, well, he was, I think he might've been starting about the same time, but it was, it was a hard thing to do back then because it's like, well, still nobody knows how to make money on it. Really. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are a few people. That are there crazy. are, there are, but I just came back from the pod fest. Oh yeah. Man. Yeah. And you know, when they do the, you know, who's a, a professional at podcasting, you know, that's a pretty, very small ratio, Yeah. you know, maybe 5% or probably something less than that are actually full-time making their money from their podcast. I would, yeah, I would be amazed if it 5%. I bet right, probably like one or two. Yeah. Well, it's not. But it doesn't mean you don't make uh, a little money. You know, if you can make a yeah. thousand dollars a month or, you know, a couple grand a month as a podcaster and you love it, like it's still totally worth it. But anyway, not to deviate from the story, I want to hear well, more. Well, the um, thing but, that was really interesting is that those were the kinds of opportunities that I could do e. without strain and without any kind of physical taxing. Well, and your voice is amazing. Well, back then it was a little weak, but I, I still had a lot of opinions and I liked to share them. <laughs> well, who doesn't? So podcasting was a great thing, right? <laughs> so I found that digital world and I just took to it. You know, I loved it and found ways to make money ho however I could. Yes. I started a cafe press print on demand shop. Okay. Where I could make t-shirts and tote bags and oh, all wow. stuff okay. like that. Yep. And <laughs> so anything, anything that I found, I would try. And in the midst of all of that, some of the people that I knew in my life were I, we lived in the Washington DC area at the time. Oh, okay. And a lot of the folks that I had had for guitar lessons and a lot of the people in our circles were people who worked in like bureaucracy or sure. they were people who worked in associations or organizations or unions. And they, a lot of them were just really burned out and they, they would start asking me like, if I wanted to have a music career, what would that look like? And I would just help them, you know, I would say, well, you know, these are the things that you need to focus on. You need to make sure that there's an audience for what you do, et cetera, et cetera. And by and large, what that turned into, I didn't call it this for a few years, but it turned into a coaching practice. Yeah. Yeah. And I found that, um, that that was a very rewarding yeah. for me and, um, and started to, started to take that more seriously. That became like the first real way you made money. Well, consistently, maybe as this, did you dabble a little bit of this, a little bit of that along the way, or maybe you didn't probably, you didn't charge enough if you're like most coaches early in your path. For about two years in between the time that I was doing 
like all the odd jobs and social services and all that stuff. For about two years, I was doing some corporate consulting with a partner. Oh. And he had asked me to just come in and be a process observer. He, um, because he thought, you know, I would be able to give him for that. You know, I would give him good feedback about what I saw happening in the group dynamic and, and I would be able to help him to make decisions about what they needed next, et cetera. And I found that I really liked that too, but I didn't like the business of it. Mm. I didn't like the business of corporate consulting. That, Being that was, out on site a lot. And, oh yeah. And it was a lot of pressure in terms of trying to find the work. Mm -hmm. It was not necessarily an easy path. But during that time I'd had one of the people that we kind of used as a mentor had said, you know, you've got a natural kind of thing for coaching. And I just kind of poo-pooed it. I just said, you know, coaching isn't, this isn't what I'm good at. You know, a musician. I'm yeah, I'm a guitar player, right? Because <laughs> all the chicks love guitar, the guitar players. <laughs> guitar goggles. <laughs> <laughs> Not, I'm, I'm sorry to use the word chicks. That's really a, a horrible term to use these days. And apologize to anyone who might be offended by that. In any case, um, I had, I remembered that. But that's what. They were when we were that age. And so oh, yeah. like, I, I don't criticize you necessarily for using that term no. and you don't have to apologize for apologizing. <laughs> for, for one of the things that I'll tell you is that for anyone who's listening, I'm 61 years old and I'm really, you know, I am a child of my time in <laughs> any case. Yeah, all of us are. <laughs> all of us are. <laughs> in this context, I think chicks was used as a, as a compliment, like the beautiful ladies that I wish I could date or whatever. Henceforth, back to the guitar. Goggles. It was a, it was definitely a rock and roll term. <laughs> uh, what was really funny though, was that I had associated coaching with executive coaching. And then sure. the, the other, the other end of the continuum was uh, Anthony Robbins, Tony Robbins. And, and I had actually taken some of his classes. He, um, I had seen the late night infomercial, yeah. signed up for unlimited power, read the book and went through the. It was a cassette series at that point. Right. right. Yeah. Like 15 cassettes and. And was it, did you like that? Was it good? I thought it was great. And yeah. I learned a lot from it. Yeah. The NLP parts of it were actually pretty useful at that time. Yeah. But th those were my frames of reference for coaching. And I didn't see what I was doing with people who were looking for, a, you know, how to start a creative career. I didn't see that as coaching for a very long time. He. Until one of the people that I was working with said, I want to pay you for this. And I said, why do you want to pay me for this? I'm just like just being a friend. Helping, you know? yeah. And she said, well, because you're coaching me and coaching is a profession and you should be paid for it. And that was really one of those times when I kind of shook my head and said, oh, I don't want to put that on a business card quite yet. But the, the one moment that I can look back on and say, Okay, this is, this is really something to pay attention to. I was in the hospital and I had just had major surgery that morning, uh, collapsed lung and they had to, you know, repair that. Wow. And so is I said, as a continuation of your illness, uh, yeah, I was still Season. in the midst of the illness and right. all of this coaching stuff was starting to happen. Yeah. And I was in the hospital and the guy who was the chaplain was a friend of mine and he was also a musician. And the thing that I remember very vividly about that night was, I mean, I had a morphine button, right? <laughs> How bad can it be? <laughs> but well, it's not, yeah, <laughs> it's not always a good sign to have a morphine button, you know? Well, at the time I needed it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that's what I'm saying. That's generally, hopefully the case. But he stopped by and it was, I don't know, it was probably around midnight and I was awake. And he just stopped in and he said, how you doing? I just wanted to check on you. You know, he's doing his hospital chaplain job, right? Yeah. Well, the conversation turned around and we started talking about his music career and his desire to start transitioning more into that hmm. full-time and as a part of his job and ultimately his full-time profession. Yeah. Our, our conversation went on for about two and a half hours. <laughs> At the end of it, I was wired for sound. Awesome. wired. So here I was just in this narcotic haze, but at the same time I was crystal clear in my mind and I was yeah. wired 
and see his challenges and opportunities more clearly than he ever had. And we could talk about it like effortlessly. Yeah. And I remember after that conversation was over that I was so energized by it that I honestly didn't get much more sleep that night, even with the drugs, you know. And that was that was really the moment when I realized there was something besides music that I could be good at. Hmm. And I ultimately hmm. look back on that as kind of the breaking point when I started to recognize that there is a difference that we need to acknowledge between what's a gift and what's a talent. Hmm. And I had a really strong musical talent, but the gift that came through was something else together. Okay. Well, and what I just heard there was you describing to some extent a moment when you finally felt useful again. Yeah. Um, because it, I have to think that the amount of body blows your ego took during this season of illness and struggle to, yeah, you know, ha earn half the income for the household or whatever, right? Like, what, yeah, you know, whatever your relationship, it's a challenge when you're like feeling vibrant. All the above. Yeah. We were lucky to have family and friends that, that got us through all of the, all of the physical needs that we had. I think the biggest, the biggest blow was to my identity. Yeah. I'd really, I wanted to be a musician yeah. since the Partridge family was on in 1969. <laughs> right. And, and when that was gone, I really yeah. didn't know who I was anymore. Yeah. So that's, that's a really remarkable moment to be able to talk about. Yeah. And so like, like where does it go from there? Or should we? Should we go there yet? Like, so that's, is that how you would define yourself in a way as, is you're a coach? Yeah. Uh, and, but a, a broad expanse, music is part of it, right? But it's also become kind of digital space and it's, it's this patchwork quilt that I could have never dreamed yeah. for myself. And I think more than anything else, I'm an opportunist and I look for the opportunity wherever it shows up. Hmm. And, um, I learn and I respond and I do what I can to be helpful to the folks who are there. Yeah. And that has turned into a really, that's turned into a really rewarding place for me to be. Yeah. Have you, um, would you describe yourself as a systems thinker? Is that kind of mm. a strength of yours? Systems is interesting. I, I'm definitely strategic. Yeah. And when I took the strengths finder. Strategic was like my number one. For sure. And um, systems are up there, but more than anything else, I kind of see. I think of systems and strategic as almost the same. They're, they're close to each other, right. for sure. The thing that I think is really interesting is that in conversations with people, I can see possibilities in my imagination. Hmm. And I can describe those possibilities to them in a way hmm. that they can understand and it triggers their desires and it gives us, um, it gives us a context to work in. Yeah. And even a shared buy-in as to yeah. what we might have to do to get there. Yeah. So that's kind of the way that I think it's like the, my imagination is very fertile. Possibilities show up there and I'm able to somehow articulate them in a way that people get it. Yeah. Fair enough. And so when did you make a transition to Northern Colorado. Can we, do, should we, is yeah. there a lot of milestones between where we just left and there or is it not a lot close? really? It was, um, I, that hospitalization story happened in 2010. Okay. And my wife wanted to do, um, she wanted to do a conference and she said, let's try, let's try Colorado and just see how it goes. And so she did a cooking or so she was hosting a conference yeah. or whatever she hosted. So she clearly was, had built her machine into something. Oh yeah, man. She, I mean, she was already well connected when she started her business Yeah, and there was a worldwide demand for what she does. Yeah. Cool. And so she's got people all over the world. Yeah. It's just crazy cool. Um, but she wanted to do a conference. And so my mom lives in Cheyenne and my dad lived in Denver at the time. And we came out here just kind of sight unseen. Yeah. This was in June of 2011. Okay. And I had gotten well enough that, you know, I, I was still in recovery, but 
I had gotten well enough that I could actually start playing again. Hmm. And so we loaded up the van and drove across the country from D.C. to uh, Cheyenne and stopped along the way. And I did house concerts with friends of mine <laughs> along the way. And then she did her conference. We got out here and um, one of the things that we were really struggling with at that time was we wanted our son to go to a Waldorf school. Hmm. And the Waldorf schools in Washington, D.C. are wonderful schools, but man, they're expensive. Yeah. It's like going to a, like an Ivy League university. Yeah, like a 30,000 plus like for it's your nine-year-old. For kindergarten. <laughs> right? right? And so we were just panicking because we wanted him to have that education. The public schools in Maryland were good, but um, we could have done better. Yeah. So we came out here and one of the things that happened was Monica was really well connected um, in a group called the Weston A. Price Foundation. And through that foundation, she heard that there was a Waldorf school that was getting ready to open in Fort Collins as a charter school, hmm. public school. Yep. And that turned her head. And I already kind of knew that I needed to be closer to home after going through that illness and being so far away from hey. my roots. Yeah. It was, tr was, it was challenging, man. Yeah. But we, we came out here in June and she did her conference found out school and we went back to DC and By said, September. Said, she said goodbye to everybody. No crap. And we, we actually moved September 26th. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. What a cool story. So, and we've been here now 11 years and, and I don't know how much longer we may stay. It's like our son has done his whole education here. It's mm. been a great experience for him. Yeah. yeah. And now. He's looking at college. He's looking at a gap year, all that kind of stuff. And where would you move to? No idea. <laughs> well, fun blank slate kind of place to be too. Yeah. So that's one of the things where I actually like the idea. Um, I do like the idea of the digital nomad. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't be opposed to spending at least a handful of months doing that to see how it fits. That's what I, uh, yeah. my kind of dream with local think tank and, and the podcast is that like local think tank should be everywhere. Yeah. And the local experience podcast could be, we could have a class A motor coach, like podcast studio. Oh, beautiful man. And just where we sell new franchises or whatever, <laughs> like I can go down there and blast a bunch of interviews out and hang out for a few weeks yeah. and then come back home. I love that vision. Yeah. That's awesome. So we'll see, you know, but I, I've got an Astro van right now that you saw in the parking lot. Is yeah. Nobody wants to have a podcast in my Astro van with me. Yeah, you uh, probably have to set up an awning or something. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> a generator in the back. <laughs> so um, before we go on to your future too much, and I want to yeah. hear more about your journey here, like how your reception was when you got to Northern Colorado and stuff, but let's jump in the time machine and go all the way back. All that's the way what back we do. where? Like all the way back to Cheyenne or okay. Denver or where did, where did young Franklin learn to tie his shoes? Yes, man. Um, well, I was born in Wyoming and, and we moved around quite a, quite a lot. Um, my dad was just, he was never, a rambling man. Well, yeah, he never could quite settle a down. Rolling Stone, I guess that's the yeah, word I was Rolling Stone, for. maybe it, but I mean. In what kind of industry or work or? He was in education. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. I mean, he was a very, very smart man. He ended up getting his PhD. He got bored quickly. Yes. <laughs> and he also, <laughs> he, he got disappointed mm. with people. Yeah. Well. Well, very quickly. Yeah. yeah the way they are. Just, he always was like three steps ahead of everybody else. Yeah. And he didn't have the patience to bring people up along with him. Yeah. Right. So we moved a lot. So I was born in Rollins, Wyoming. We moved to Lander. Or no, mm -hmm. we moved to Evanston when I was a year old. Okay. Yeah. We moved to Lander when I was two years old. We moved to Provo, Utah to get his master's degree when I was three or four. Yeah. And then we moved back to Evanston from that was one of the places that we lived the longest um then we moved to laramie to get his phd and then we moved to greeley for his first job and then we moved into the oil patch in wyoming so we moved a lot interesting so, and really on pursuit kind of of your dad's kind of yeah career and not to say follies at all but it's an unusual thing for such a education-minded person to hang around wyoming the whole time 
Well, yeah. that was his home state. You know? Yeah, I guess there. that's what you know. And he was well known in the state. He had oh, been a star athlete in high school. Okay, yeah. So he had a lot of connections. He'd gone to the yeah, University of Wyoming. Yeah. But um, how cool! What did, I mean, it's really interesting. It was probably traumatic, though. And did you have siblings as well? And was I your am. mom just chasing the littles, or did she have a career? Or? Well, that's an interesting story in itself. My, I have three younger sisters. Okay, and um, my mom was raised in Virginia, and they met at a they met at a camp, a Quaker camp in upstate New York. Wait, these are family Quakers? No. Okay. Neither one of them. <laughs> okay. Mom's Episcopalian, dad's Mormon. Was just Quaker. The, yeah. Well, one of the, one, one of the, my favorite stories is that one of their campers was Bonnie Raitt. Yeah. Interesting. She was right. like eight years old. Right. Cool. So one of the things that was fun about, you know, about growing up in Wyoming, Wyoming to me is the biggest small town in the world. <laughs> yeah. And it's a, it's a huge state, but it's like. If I ever want to meet anybody from Wyoming, anywhere in the world, all I have to do is wear my University of Wyoming sweatshirt. <laughs> right. Yeah, and it's more effective than a Rotary Club pin. You got it, man. Yeah. Anybody who recognizes that will have something to talk about. <laughs> and that has happened to me over and over and over again. I don't doubt. Right. But um, so we did move a lot. And I think there's some, there are certainly some, some ways that I was affected by that. But one of the things that I got really comfortable with was making friends easily. Mm. And I would always find a group of people yeah. and I would always work my way in fairly fun, effortlessly. Fun Franklin. Fun. And I would, you know, it was easy to, to establish rapport. I, I never had the gift of gab, but I was always someone that, you know, I was a good listener. Yeah. People liked yeah. that. <laughs> well, for sure. Um, but I remember... Um, when I was 13, I was given a, I, I begged for a guitar, man. I didn't, I wasn't given a guitar. I begged for a guitar. <laughs> and, um. You begged long enough to finally get a guitar. Two years. Yeah. And they gave it to me for Christmas that year. And the guitar was the first time that I had felt like I knew who I was. He. And I felt like that I had a place in my peer group. Oh, wow. And so the guitar was my way of connecting with people easily and. It was also the thing that I could be good at. Yeah. I was not a good athlete. Yeah. And, uh, and in Wyoming, athletics are pretty important. I was just not ever real talented yeah. in athletics. And, you know, if you're going to be good at athletics, you got to be, you got to grow up as a team. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Yeah. And so yeah, all of the people that. that got to play were, they had been playing with each other since they were in fourth grade, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, not everybody just succeeds there. Yeah. Uh, were you a good student at the same time? I was a horrible student. How come? I was a daydreamer. Yeah. And I didn't, yeah. um, you know, I, I don't know about ADHD or ADD. probably throwing your dad crazy because he's like this Mr. Sparty Pants doing all these things. And you're like, if you would just try Franklin, you would do so much better. You know, though, that wasn't his deal. What was really interesting with my dad, um, he had been a guidance counselor before he was a principal. Okay. And, um... When he was a guidance counselor, he would give me achievement tests. And so he knew what was going on with my, with my capabilities. He knew I could do math, but I was slow. He, he knew that I could, you know, he knew that I could write, but comprehension wasn't something that I did easily or quickly, hmm. right? I had to read something over and over and over again yeah, yeah. to comprehend it. And most teachers weren't taught to, to teach to that. Yeah. skills. Yeah. 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 So I struggled in school yeah. and I would always be, you know, eyes out the window. School. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fair. You know, fair. Okay. So, but guitar really became a thing. Oh yeah. Like right away, like immediately. Once you got that guitar, you were like playing three hours a day or an hour a day or whatever. Up until last year, it was the one thing that I did almost every day of my life. Wow. Yeah. But you don't you don't play at all, even recreationally, or I do play recreationally. I just don't play every day. Yeah, um, I don't play frequently anymore. Is it part of your hands, or it's just... part of it. I also last year I I decided to retire from performing. Yeah, um, I had been performing since I was seventeen in high school. Yeah, and I loved performing. For the last several years, it had gotten really, really hard to do. And I think part of it is that. Performing is an athletic thing. It's oh, physical. Yeah. 
For sure. And you get up there and you play for two and a half or three hours. And at the end of the night, there's a payment, yeah. right? <laughs> Not just the money in your pocket, but in, in blood, sweat, and tears. Yeah. Yeah. What I started to notice was that it was taking me longer to recover. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't, <laughs> I didn't have it. This isn't the same at all, but the, the New Year's party we went to this year had a karaoke set up. Oh yeah. <laughs> and, uh, a bunch of people sang and stuff like that, but like I sang and then I was clearly like the, the big voice in the room that yeah. could really sing a lot of different songs and stuff. So now I've got like everybody like Kurt, sing another one, Kurt, sing another one. <laughs> and I'm kind of drunk and I sang like five or six songs. And then I hear my own voice kind of cracking and not capable. And the next day I'm all like hoarse, you know, cause I haven't sung in years really, you know, crazy, right? It's wild. It's, it's amazing how much of a physical demand even singing six karaoke songs. Like when I was yeah. 25, that was a piece of cake, yeah, but that was two beers, man. You were <laughs> crazy. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But, and it, and it, we just, it's just like how our eyesight doesn't really like, I can't read up close very good. It's not as flexible as it used to be. And so the same thing, when you stretch your physical abilities in a performance art of some sort, it just doesn't recover the same way. Yeah. So, so ever since I was sick, my new, I had some limitations that I had to yeah. really work around and work with. And over the last few years, it just got to the point where, especially at the end of the I've started to develop some pain in my knees and hips. Mm. And you're, if you're standing for three hours at a time, yeah. your yeah. knees and your hips are going to scream. Well, right? uh, we might find some time where you can do a, a 30 minute in the chair guitar scene for one of our things or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still open to do this stuff like that. But, I decided last year that, you know, what I really wanted to have for a while was one job. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> yeah, you've had more than one job for uh, 42 Decades. years. <laughs> yeah. So, um, it's like, where did that take you? Did you like get into like a music school after high school then? Were you in a yeah. high school band? Like, what was that for you? I had a, I had a high school teacher that I always have to give credit to. His name was Joe Ruley. Okay. And Joe saw something in me that I couldn't see for myself. And he gave me every opportunity that I could have ever wanted. Hey, Joe. All the, all the encouragement I could have you. ever had, man, still gets me ripped up. But had Joe Ruley not been in my life at that time, I don't know where I would have ended up. Mm -hmm. I probably would have been doing manual labor somewhere. And I wasn't planning on going to college until about three weeks before school started. Well, all of my friends started to leave. And I had no idea what I was going to do. And my parents were good. They were saying, you know, you don't have to decide right now. You could take some time yeah, off. Yeah, take a gap year whatever. Down. But as it got closer, I thought, you know, I should just go to school and figure it out as I go. Right. So Either I went that out. Or somebody's going to expect me to get a job. Yeah, right. <laughs> we were living in Casper, Wyoming at the time. And um, Casper College turns out has one of the best music programs for a community college in the whole country. <laughs> and I went and auditioned and they gave me a scholarship fee, a Pell grant. I got a scholarship. I didn't have to pay for my tuition for three years. Uh -huh. And that gave me a lot of experience in music. And it gave me, um, it gave me the confidence that I needed to actually say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and get a degree in music and my mom said, y'all always have to have some, something to fall back on. So I got a side degree in business. Okay. And, um, I ended up going from Casper to Indiana to a little school called Anderson. He, they had a music business program, which was a combined degree. Okay. Perfect. And that was, that was it. It's like, I, I look at my life as one long, happy accident. You know, <laughs> I, I fair. never know very far ahead of time where I'm going to be. Yeah. I always like where I land. Yeah. You, know, you know, I think, uh, I talk about life that way sometimes, like you can tell when you're going cross current or oh, yeah, a, against the flow of what God or the universe or whatever that force in the world oh, yeah. is. Uh, we don't have time for all those stories, but I have several. <laughs> right. I'm yeah. sure. I'm sure. So how did you, when did you find your, your wife? How did you make your way to the sea? <laughs> what, what you're like, what you get out of out of this master's degree in music and you're doing what? Well, 
I, that's when I actually took on all of those weird jobs. I couldn't, you know, I had this degree in music and business and I didn't have any idea how to have a music career. So it was all like, I had to learn everything over. Yeah. 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 So I was taking all these day jobs just to pay the bills, you know, while I was doing that. Um, I was married at the time and went through a divorce. And after the divorce happened, I recognized that I had really set music aside for a while he, and I wanted it back. Right. And so I started playing again, started going out and playing for blues jams and yeah. and jazz nights and stuff like that and meeting people in the music community. So were you like lead guitar and vocal? Was that your place in the music world or? At that time, mostly just guitar. I didn't really start singing until I was in my 30s. Oh, is that right? Okay. Um, and about, I don't know, is it after the divorce and after this relationship breakup that I went through, I started writing songs because oh. it was like, that was the way that I could actually get all of this stuff yeah, process that that going junk. on yeah. out. And so I just started writing songs and, um, do you remember the first song you wrote? Uh, that was a long time ago. That was like when I was, yeah, it was <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel you. Well, I was on the piano and I just, I. I took the chords that sounded good together and I made something I <laughs> Fair enough. played it for the school talent show. The best songs I've written, I've written in my head in the shower and they're yeah. gone. That's how it's supposed to happen. <laughs> you know, I let them go after that. Usually <laughs> they're still in the ether. Okay, maybe I'll give them back someday. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm going to hope that that can happen for you, man. Cause it's happened for me. Yeah. I don't doubt it. I don't, I was thinking something in here the other day when I was testing the mics and, and the girls, Alicia and all were like, what was did that? you just make that up? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I just did. It was only two verses, but it was pretty good. I love um, it. And I don't have to like turn it into anything more. Like I can actually be very satisfied with letting it just kind of float off and yeah. not be part of what I build my life around and just be blessed by the fact that sometimes little weird songs come to me and I sing them. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's the way it kind of happens. It's like, I have songs that I started, you know, 20 years ago and I just finished last year. <laughs> like a, and they, they come back and it's like, oh, now, now I know what I did this. But, um, so one of the things that happened was that as I started to write songs, one of the side businesses that I had started was a recording service. Okay. Doing jingles, demos, stuff like that. Yeah. And I would just go set up my e recording equipment. Mr. People's Clean houses. Is the name. <laughs> Behind the <laughs> Yeah. Or whatever, yeah, right? right? Local yeah. radio stations when radio was the main <laughs> way people found people and stuff. It's more about like Rogers Trout Farm. <laughs> <laughs> Go on down to Rogers Trout Farm. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing that was interesting to me, that, that was, that was interesting. And I liked that kind of work, but the thing that I loved was working in the studio. I, I really enjoyed being in the studio mm. and I had learned that in college, you know, how, like not behind the microphone, but more behind the both board, both playing and engineering. I loved it. I, I enjoyed. It. So. That side business was one that I kind of carried with me all the way along and I still do it. Not as much as I used to, but I still That's cool. do a little bit of recording here and there. Um, but I think, you know, at some point I realized, um, I was burning out in the social services. Mm -hmm. I was getting work in the consulting that paid really, really well. Yep. And I could work one weekend a month and pay all of my bills. <laughs> and so I just decided, you know, this opportunity probably won't come along again. Yeah. So I'm going to move to Nashville. That's where I thought I was going to spend the rest of my life. Mm. And I loved Nashville, the people that I met there. Yeah. About six months in, the consulting jobs went away. <laughs> it was a, um, now Nashville's eating your lunch. Well, it was a downturn. You know, it was an economic downturn businesses stopped hiring consulting right it's like that's what happens when the economy tanks usually the consultants right uh, find work elsewhere <laughs> right well the only job that i could find in nashville i could not find any musical job that paid anywhere i can imagine a downturn there's people buying less music and stuff too right well not only that it's like in nashville you've got 10 amazing guitar players for every hundred <laughs> bad ones <laughs> right 
And they're all working. I mean, and they're working right. for very little money. Right. They're lucky to pay. Yeah. They're lucky to make 50 grand a year. And that includes going on the road for two thirds <laughs> of the year, right? <laughs> so the thing that was fun about it though, was that I was around other songwriters and I was around other studios and I was around other people who were producing and recording. Okay. So I, I actually call those two years in Nashville graduate school. Right. That was where I learned both, first of all, that Nashville wasn't the place that I needed to be. And second of all, it's where I learned the things that I needed to do to have a career in music. Mm. Yeah. Because so, if you could make it fit together in there in that tough time yeah. and whatever. But I didn't have a career in music in Nashville. I had a hobby in music in Nashville. <laughs> right. It was a very passionate hobby. I met a person online. Um, who lived in the Washington, D.C. area. And this was back in the AOL yeah, days. It must have been like the first uh, first days of Match.com. Yeah. <laughs> it was AOL, man. It was AOL, and it was like, it wasn't even Match.com. That wasn't even, that didn't, that didn't exist. exist. That wasn't even a spark in the imagination. Nothing. Um, but we met in a chat group on AOL that was about music and dancing and stuff like that. And she invited me to come up to D.C., and, and I had no reason to go up there other than that. But in the weekend that I went to visit, I went to a uh, Cajun and Zydeco dance at Glen Echo. I went to two music parties and met a bunch of musicians and a bunch of people that were, you know, involved That's fun. in the scene. Yeah, yeah. Went to two concerts, like singer songwriters. Yeah, yeah. Stuff like that. Well, plus the economy is good in DC because the money's still flowing. No, it was. <laughs> It was grand. DC is still time. growing. I, yeah. still, I still kick myself that I couldn't afford a house at that time <laughs> because that house would have quadrupled in price sure. in the time that I lived there. But, um, so the, the, the icing on the cake, there were two things that happened. I got offered a job at a music store and this person that I went to visit had just bought a house and needed to have the basement remodeled. And you're like, I can set up for you. I had, I had very tenuous carpentry skills heat <laughs> but there was books at the library that told you how to do stuff and there was there was a tool library that was right across the heat wave where she lived and, and she was super cute well she was and and that was good but the chemistry didn't work out oh, anyhow sorry i thought that was going to be your wife i was no. jumping ahead of the bus no that's not too far down the road though um, what's really interesting is that the only job that I could find in Nashville was installing carpet. And we were working at a Motel 6 with no air conditioning in the middle of summer. E. It was 105 degrees. That's really and nice. The day I remember reaching my lowest point was, it was 105 degrees. There were tornadoes. A tornado <laughs> ripped right through downtown Nashville that day. And we were in this Motel 6, no air conditioning. And the fumes in the room were just absolutely off the map. <laughs> crazy right. we had to keep the doors Carpet removal spray glue dissolver oh man all of it we had to keep the doors closed and not only that why because the guests would complain because the sink was too there were no guests it was closed <laughs> okay there was a pack of stray dogs that was circling the hotel all day long and there weren't knobs on the doors there were the, the handles the yeah so if they they were able to jack the handle so we had to deadbolt the doors right that day when the rest of the crew left for lunch i was a puddle in the middle of the floor going my life can amount to this and it wasn't long after that 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 trip to washington dc happened and i saw i saw an open door I see the hatch. and i didn't look back <laughs> So my wife and I met not long after I moved there. And shoddily re remodeled this basement. We weren't even, we didn't even date for four years after. Um, we just kept running into each other. Oh, that's fun. Right. And we kept going, hey, there's something about that person. Yeah. Just, you know, file it away. But then four years later, we ended up together. And, and you're a musician in D.C.? Yeah. Was it quickly right. that, like you were at the music store and stuff, but then all of a sudden you got connections, you got people that want to hear you play, you find a bass player and a drummer. It was perfect. I could play anywhere I wanted to up and down the East Coast. He. 
And, um, and that's what I did for about seven, eight years. I would do gigs on Friday and Saturday night. Um, as I you, do, or are you with other people just usually? Me. Oh, well, I was singing my own stuff yeah. and it was like a singer songwriter. And I had never intended to become that either. Hmm. I was teaching guitar lessons and I found that I really, really loved that as well. Yeah. So I was teaching guitar lessons Sunday through Thursday and then playing yeah. gigs on Friday and Saturday. I like it. Yeah. And that was your career for most of that time and until. About eight years till I got sick. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. So I guess that seems like we can jump back to where we jumped off a little sure. bit as you show up here in Northern Colorado after the conference and yeah, whatever. And, you know, it's September of whatever year that was, 2012, 2011, 2011. Yeah. And uh, how did you, like, how was that reception and, and what was Northern Colorado like? Call out some differences and some similarities from what you'd experienced before. You knew Wyoming, of course, but it's different. Well, Wyoming, I'd been away from for a really long time. I'd left yeah. in 83. Right. And oh, it was yeah, almost you know, 30 years. I hardly knew anybody there anymore other than a few people that had stayed. You yeah. Know. Unless you wore your Wyoming sweatshirt. Yeah. Like right. <laughs> and my mom is well connected. My mom knows people everywhere in, mm. in the state. So I always had that to fall back on. But I, I knew that I needed to come back here to be closer to my parents. Mm -hmm. And um, when I had gotten sick, I felt like that I was too far away. And so we moved back here and um, kind of split the difference. We ended up in Loveland, which was halfway between Cheyenne and Denver. Yeah. And um, I, I knew that I wanted to do music, but I also knew that coaching was a way that I could. You kind of made this discovery recently and yeah, new space, a new place. So I started doing both and ultimately got a job as a music director at the Unity Church mm. over on Vine Drive. I mm -hmm. worked there for six years. Um, and then one of the things that was very interesting is like, it may have been my age. It may have been the style of music that I do. Um, I played some really cool gigs when I first moved here, but I found it really hard to break into the scene. He, um, and I, I get it. I mean, this scene is not, a, it's not a large one. Yeah. Certainly not a large pond and the same players have been pretty, pretty dominant in the yeah. scene yeah. for quite a while. Wendy Wu and Leftover Salmon get good gigs, but. Oh, they're all good, man. Right and they deserve them. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to take away from those yeah. folks. They're good. Good musician. But yeah, there's probably too few. It's such a small market that there's not enough ticket buyers to feed that many bands and musicians, yeah. you know, ultimately. The, um, the thing that I looked at before we moved was I wanted to see how many, how many opportunities there were to play within a hundred mile radius. Mm. And so that included places like Colorado Springs, some of the mountain towns, Laramie and Cheyenne, right, right. Greeley, Windsor. Denver, you know, it included a, a significant number of uh, venues. And I found ultimately I could, I could do okay. I could probably play three or four nights a week right, and be okay. But the gigs that I wanted were elusive. Yeah. yeah. And they were the ones that were going to the folks who had been here for the longest and, you know, that everybody knew. And yeah, yeah. I was also an older guy. I was like, you know, approaching 50. Yeah. And those folks were all at that point, some of them were in their twenties and thirties. Now they're in their fifties and I can. Well, and, and to some extent they're willing to put on a great show yeah. for less money than you're willing to do. And they got a band of four, you know, or well, whatever, like yeah. that's just an example, but like they're young and hungry and yeah. you're like, I don't, I have to work that long for that hard for that little bit of money, you know? Well, I think that was one of the things that was really interesting is when I was in college, I got spoiled because I could play, I could go out and play in a bar when I was in college, hmm. even in high school, I shouldn't say that out loud. I played at a place in Casper called the Sandbar Lounge Yeah, and the Sandbar, they'd pay a kid 75 bucks a night. Right. Plus tips. Yeah. You might make 200 bucks in tips if it was a busy night. And yeah, and that was doable. <laughs> and, and music also was, it was pretty hot. You know, right. people loved, people loved live music. Yep. 
Well, and in Castro at that time, it was probably less local stuff happening. You know, now yeah. there's a lot more developed scene and Fort Collins scene was pretty young when I got, I got here in 99. Okay. So yeah. You, yeah. You were so right I on saw it develop. Right I, I, yeah. I smelled it. it like yeah. I, it, cause Fargo, North Dakota, where I came from was a little bit similar that, you know, Minneapolis is not too far away. Yeah. There's some good music scene there. And then like, if you're heading from Minneapolis to Seattle, like there ain't many places to stop before Fargo and not many places after. So you're probably going to stop there. So a lot of good music came through Fargo. I spent my 19th birthday in a bar in Fargo oh. and it was on the, it's not, it, it's, it wasn't on the North Dakota side. Oh, uh, Kirby's maybe, or Ralph's 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 was my yeah. favorite. One of my favorite bars. Yeah. Ralph's was the best. It was, uh, like kind of gay bar in the front. Pool yeah. bar in the back and then the music punk, in punk the bar in the yeah. back back. So I was in the pool crowd where you could smoke weed be way before it was legal. <laughs> but they didn't have punk at the time that I was there. Well, it was mostly yeah. punk bands when I was there. When I was there, they had a three-piece band that was like Rush or Triumph. It was oh, one of those. cool. But it was, no, it was more like ZZ Top because they were doing Boogie. You know, it was oh, like, cool. And I'll never forget that, that night was just amazing. What was this? You were 19, so that was way before my time. It was, it was before well, the drinking age yeah. was 21 and we had to, we had to go back across the state line <laughs> because it was 19 on one side and it was 21 on the other. That's right. Cool. So anyway, well, getting back, Hey, I dagger. Uh, North Dakota, Minnesota. <laughs> <Probably. Yep. laughs> go Kirby's, go, uh, Ralph's. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Kirby's was right across the street. That was more of the kind of mainstream traditional bar, at least later on down the line. Was it a biker spot? No, more yes, of a, a rock and roll kind of, you know, whatever Midwest. Kinda. Yeah. But a little bit, a little bit edgy, but not like Ralph's, you know, yeah. good, good kids didn't go to Ralph's really. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing that was really funny when I moved to Fort Collins, and when we moved here, you know, I knew that there were a lot of gigs around and I could always find places to play. Yeah. But by the time we moved here, the thing that I noticed was, for the the average gig was still paying 75 bucks right and this is what i made back in later. 1979 right <laughs> 30 years later yeah I'm, almost 40 years later it's right like, and i'm still making 75 bucks a night and i'm hauling my own gear and i am you know i'm playing in places where people are drinking and they don't want to hear music they right. just want to talk right and at the end of the night i would just scratch my head and wonder is this really what I want to do? Is this really want, how I want to spend my time? Because the the singer songwriter scene, where you can go out and sing original songs, yeah, yeah. My perception is that 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 scene has shrunk significantly in the last fifteen years. Uh, probably across the country, I, I think there's there's been a lot of the venues have closed or they've changed. Um, one of the things I think that's really interesting is that the the crowd aged with the artist. Right. And the aging crowd doesn't go out as much. Right. Totally. I'm that way. Yeah, I don't go out. Yeah, I don't go out that much. You know, I, I used to see 20 bands a year. Yeah. Now I see five, maybe, six, three, yeah, or something like that. Five and, of them are at the festival. <laughs> right. Well, exactly. I, I was going to say, you know, I've got Focal MX coming up and I'll probably see 20 that weekend. Um, but other than that, it's a, it's a small batch, you know, it's just not something I target my, yeah. my life on as much. Well, there were, to. there were two people that I met that actually were probably more helpful than anybody else. One was Greta Cornette. Yeah. Folk Boy Max. And awesome. the other one was Chris Kresge, Chris K. Yes. Chris K is a radio guy and he, he produces a show called the Colorado Sound. He was also a sound guy at Oscar Blues. Oh yeah, I know who that is now. Over in in Long, and I went there and played um, an open mic one night. And yeah. I went, went I went there and played, and he liked what I did, and I just was able to say, "Chris, can you tell me where to play?" And yeah. he gave me a list. So those two folks put me, you cool. know, in some kind of a yeah yeah in some kind of a direction. That's awesome. I met at a backyard barbecue probably back in 2003. Oh, serious. Or something like that. <laughs> We've kind of circled around each other's radius over the time since. But if you're listening, Greta, you're awesome. Yeah. Um, 
And so when did you get involved with like coaching for real and the small business development center and things like that? That's very interesting. Um, I started, I mean, I was coaching in DC before we moved. Okay. And I had a pretty nice group of clients there and really satisfied with the way that it was working. It was a hundred percent. I was not doing any marketing. Yeah. It was a hundred percent word of mouth and people would just, you know, tell other people yeah. how things were going. What was really funny is that a lot of the people that I worked with early on were union members. Yeah. And I've got a couple of those union members that still send me new clients every year <laughs> because they remember how important it was for them yeah, cool. to, to, to go through that process then. Um, you know, it's an interesting story. Uh, I, I decided when we moved out here that I wanted to do coaching, uh, kind of on equal par with music. I didn't want to. Yeah. I didn't want to. You didn't want to squash coaching yeah. to focus on music. I didn't want it to be a side hustle. Yeah. You know, just take it seriously. So I started to learn, just started to really learn the profession, mm. took classes and did some, I worked with some coaches of my own, that just really set me on a good path. And, um, <laughs> interestingly enough, I had the job at Unity. I was the music oh, right. director at Unity, yep. right? Well, Mike O'Connell oh. from SBDC. Sure. He was the director of the SBDC here in Larimer. He was on the board. Okay, <laughs> fair. And we just got to talking and, and, you know, he, he knew that that was something that I was doing. Yeah. But I had met uh, Marianne um, mm. over in Loveland. Yeah, the previous director there. She was, yeah, she was the director in the Loveland office. And I had met her actually. I was a client in the Loveland office before, right? Before Just anything, to because your stuff, when we moved whatever. here, yeah, I went to there, did all that, had a meeting with Robin and with Marianne, and um, I I just started going to networking meetings like all the time, meeting people, yeah, finding jobs where I could, finding opportunities where I could. I would do presentations on social media marketing and things like that because those were things that I had developed some skill in. And it was still fairly manageable yeah, and still fairly new that people were interested in that. Yeah. And Marianne asked me if I would be ever be interested in working with creatives through SBDC or through the Loveland office. Mm -hmm. And she talked to Mike about it and Mike said, yeah, let's ask him to do that. Yeah. So I went ahead and went through the tests and whatever training sure. went along with it. Um, and I found that I really liked it a lot. And so I've been there since March of 2018. Okay. Guys, that's probably, we got acquainted not too, you know, were we acquainted through there or yeah, else I think that's actually where we started. Okay. That's, we started about the same time. Yeah. Well, but I had been involved with the Small Business Development Center actually going back to 2009, maybe. I've been uh, yeah. volunteering and different things and stuff like that. So, but before Mike O'Connell's time. Oh, really? Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, so you were there a long time ago. Yeah. And Andrea Grant was oh, yeah. one of the OG OGs and that's how she and I got acquainted and that's how Very Local cool. Think Tank started. Very cool. Yeah. So she had been a Vista chair <laughs> and I knew her through that and there was at least two or three executive directors before Mike. That's uh, awesome. Mostly short run. And uh, yeah. so, yeah, so anyway, that's interesting. Um, so the parallel line that happened along the way was... That I had continued to do all the digital stuff. Mm. I had continued to have podcasts and blogs. And um, I started a YouTube channel, Fits and Starts, for many years. Okay. And then finally started to take that seriously a few years ago. And what's that channel? Franklin Taggart Coaching. Okay. Yeah. I have a music channel too, but that one's pretty, uh, pretty lame. So do you imagine coaching for a long time? I'm going to probably do it for as long as I can work. Yeah. I love the work and I love the people and yeah. I love to see the, I love to see the aha moments and the trans transformations happen. Yeah. And so talk to me about like an ideal client for you. Are you kind of one of those coaches that comes in and then leaves them awesome six months later and check you later? Or are you kind of one of those guys that might have multi-year engagements and it just decreases or increases based on the season? <laughs> um, yeah. Talk to me about, like the, some of the stories maybe that you've really made an impact for or those people that write you the best reviews. It's interesting. And 
it's hard for me to, to, to say that I have an ideal client. And the avatar exercises have been elusive for You've me. You've got three really different ideal clients or whatever. Yeah. One of the things that's really interesting is I went through a coaching program. Um, it was at that time it was called advanced client systems and it was, uh, by a coach named Steve Chandler. Mm -hmm. and one of the things that Steve Chandler always talked about was that there's a client in every room. Yeah. And he said, you know, one, one of the things that happens with the ideal client idea is that you start missing yeah. cues. <laughs> And I kind of agree with that. And that's yeah. been my experience. It's like through the networking, what I found was if I can set two appointments a week from the networking that I, from one networking meeting, I can set two appointments. That's two conversations that either lead to it's or referrals. And that's been, it's yeah. it's worked, right? Yeah. And I don't necessarily want to do group programs and I don't necessarily want to do membership programs and I don't necessarily want to do Anything you want to stay in the creative space, scale. especially. I love working with creative people, um, but that's a pretty broad brush, man. <laughs> for sure. And so I almost consider myself a creative. You are. Yeah. I, I don't hesitate to call you a creative because everything that you've got here, you have conceived and said, this is what I want to do. And that is an act of creativity. There's no question in my mind. About it. Fair. Entrepreneurship is absolutely creative. There is nothing non-creative about <laughs> entrepreneurship. Yeah. Right. And entrepreneurs are some of the most creative people that I've met and, and their idea momentum. Yeah. It's capacity funny. is just crazy. I, sus I sense that you have a similarity of uh, appreciation of word precision. Yeah. And there's a lot of difference between a business person and an entrepreneur. Oh, absolutely. And, but they're almost used interchangeably in like the the mainstream or or whatever but like yeah uh, how would you differentiate an entrepreneur from a business person i think the business person is the one who's comfortable in the roles that need to be taken in order for a business to function and sustain mm. itself mm -hmm. entrepreneurs don't necessarily fit that category <laughs> they don't like <right>? that <laughs> well the, ultimately the business person is the one who comes in after the entrepreneur yeah yes yeah. because the business person in my mind is somebody who's really good at follow through he, they're able to structure things. They're able to create systems. They're able to manage. They're yeah. able to do all of those roles. Yeah. That the entrepreneur may feel. Usually they flail at. Well, the bit. entrepreneur is going to get, you know, probably hives and prison. Attacks. <laughs> yeah. If they have to actually. You know, sure. If they have to show up as a manager or if they have to show up as a, you know, uh, anything but um, a catalyst, you know. Yeah, yeah. So the thing that I look at with entrepreneurs is that the people that I call entrepreneurs are the people that just absolutely have an idea that they can't let go of until it is something. Ooh. And it's a hundred percent creative. Yeah. Fair enough. Whereas a business person, if they see that they've got three lines of business and one of them is not making any money, they're like, well, let's let that go. Yeah. See you later. Well, the business person has that practical mentality, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the business person also is somebody uh -huh. that can come in and say, um, you know, I, I'll take these doTERRA oils and I'm going to make a business out of it. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to work the system yep. and I'm going to use that to make money for myself. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Big difference. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, so I guess to get back to that question a little bit. So what I think I'm starting to hear is just like clarity and understanding are some of your big principles, right? When you're working with your clients and whatever those diverse ideal clients oh, yeah. are. Clarity and understanding are probably, um, they're, they're probably core to everything that I do. Yeah. The, there are a couple of things that I look at the, the, the people that I feel the most compassion for he. are the people who have deferred their creative dreams to the point that they're suffering. He, and they just, they have to do something about it now. Or it's going to be too late, right? <laughs> yeah. An example of that is one of the people that I worked with early on, um, actually it was a recording client of mine in DC and it was a woman who had just turned 60. Okay. She'd been a songwriter since she'd been in her twenties yeah. and she wow. had wanted to make an album 
but she was she was very self conscious about her voice. Oh wow! And so I took her under my wing and I said, "We're going to make your album." Yeah. And so the thing that was really interesting about that was that probably about ten percent of it was production, eighty percent of it was encouragement and and getting her through the the yeah. tremors. Yeah, yeah. And then the other ten percent of it was, um, you know, crying. Right, right. <laughs> you know, yeah. And it was just, it was one of those things where she, she had that dream and it was so potent for her that she'd reached a point in her life. She'd gotten a PhD in another field wow. and had been a university professor wow. for 40 years. It all kind of misaligned with what she really wanted to do and be the whole time. But like all those efforts, all, the PhD and everything it was kind of worth it once you get that album out and released in some ways, I imagine anyway. It was amazing, man. That, you know, the thing that, that I look back on, those kinds of things happened over and over and over mm. again for me, where I would be in the role of, oh, that's what you want to do? Yeah. We've yeah. got a bar and let's put on a show. You know, <laughs> that's one of my favorite lines from <laughs> Andy Hardy. Yeah. Uh, Mickey Rune. You know. We've got a bar and let's put on a show. It's like whenever they would say what they wanted to do, that possibility would become crystalline in my mind. And I would see, oh my God, we, this is all we have to do. Yeah. And henceforth, frankly, your reset podcast, the yeah. one that I was on, which was, you know, in some ways, I think you recognize that within my recent past, when we first got acquainted and yeah. I was fresh out of banking and whatever. And it reminds me of when I went to the Rotary Club right after quitting my bank job and half the club was like, high fives this is going to be great you're going to love it and the other half was like you're an idiot and how irresponsible of a husband can you be to your wife you know yeah. for quitting your banker job i don't think you're an idiot at all man you had a vision right and it would have like it could have died on the vine you know well you tried that with the cooking deal right <laughs> fair you did it, well, yeah that's just well, that's that was another it. it was yeah. like it was like oh like, i want to try this and you tried it and you found that it just didn't quite work out. Yeah, fair. No, n nothing, you know, that's not, that's not a failure as far as I'm concerned. I think that's just. No, I don't think of it as okay. that. Yeah. Next. I learned something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> lessons, expensive lessons. <laughs> Check. <laughs> exactly right. Expensive lessons. And there have been a few. Yeah. yeah. So, um, what else do you want to tell us about your like special sauce and place? Yeah, I've, yeah. I've really been intrigued by. Um, that, that clarity and purpose. And one of these days, have you learned about the, the Hallows relational intelligence that I've been doing at all? I haven't. Oh, you might have to check it out. Get on my website sometime or whatever, but look it up. But I suspect that you're a, a brown type and green type, uh, which, um, do you want the, the 90 second overview? Yeah. It's like, it's, it's a little bit like DISC or Myers-Briggs, but okay. simpler, more intuitive, and more aligned with what you've already observed based on, frankly, your green and brown types. Um, so I'm a white green. Okay. Uh, white is like full of ideas, uh, principles, values, focus, kind of have a hundred great ideas a week, but doesn't always execute much, has a huge inbox, all that kind of stuff. And then green is the social relational. Yeah. So that's the heart type with the white type. The blue type, you're wearing all blue today, but I don't think you're a blue necessarily. Not always. You might have some of that as your developed trait, but that's another conversation. But the blue is the organizer planner. No, and that, is, that is not him. <laughs> right. You want it's to call just somebody the color, else for that. sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's the blue type is kind of the logical analytical. The green is here in the heart. The orange is the achiever entrepreneur. Very driven. Almost every Olympian mm -hmm. has at least that as part of their thing. Entrepreneurs, most of my local facilitators are at least half orange mm -hmm. and many of my members. And then finally is the brown type. And the brown type, like the white type is a kind of a cloud above the rest. Yeah. The brown type is kind of the interwoven and understands all of it. And they always want to know a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, they want to get a little deeper, understand a little bit more how the unintended consequences of things might be all the stuff in that space and they seem super annoying to the oranges because they're like let's just get it done yeah, you know right. move fast and <laughs> it doesn't matter the carnage that we cause 
Exactly. So sometimes browns and oranges have challenge with each other, but they can also be very beneficial conflicts in some ways. So my guess is that you're brown green. It's very interesting. And maybe with some orange in the center would be my speculation. As you were describing it, you were you were doing the chakra system. Maybe, yeah. Because the white up here okay. is, I mean, it's generally, and the color codes that you oh, used are right. very similar to the chakra system. That doesn't surprise me. And um, they also somewhat follow the Tibetan system and the Chinese medicine system. So it's like... That's kind of what I've been it's noticing is it was all very intuitive. This is a Brazilian system. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Uh, but Bettina introduced me to it. Oh, very cool. And they're here, or they were here in Northern Colorado. Yeah. Because the founder of the system, who is a white, green, orange like me, um, found her husband a connection to get them with JBS and moving up here because he's a brown type too. Yeah. And uh, so it's almost a brown blue. So she's systems thinking and organized. Which oh is gosh. one of the reasons she's so useful to me. Yeah, and fast and smart. That's awesome. She's young, so she doesn't know much, but she can learn it real fast and wants to. She, she yeah, you can't have her, so whatever. I don't want her. Yeah. I don't want an employee. I don't want any. <laughs> I don't want anybody to supervise. That's that's the other thing. Is like my my podcast now is called Your Own Best Company. Oh yeah, that's right. And, like a solopreneur's kind of. Well, one of the things that I found, one of the gaps that I found was. There's not a lot of support and encouragement out there for people who actually want to work alone. Yeah. yeah. And what I discovered in my own process was that, especially when it comes to the creativity, yeah. I really need to have solitude he, and I honor that. And it's like, for me, solitude has the same level of importance he, as profit. Right. He, so one of the things that I looked at was that for me, solitude is a bottom line. Yeah. And so your own best company came out of that desire to offer some support and encouragement to people yeah. who want to be a team of one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and Frank, I was just thinking like local think tank, we have a builders chapter, yeah. but part of the name of it is you want to be building something. Yeah. Like we don't really want solopreneurs that want to stay that way forever. Yeah. Um, and that's, it's just as like, there's so many challenges with hiring and keeping and maintaining relationships and things like that, that that's, kind of part of what local think tank's mission is. Yeah. But I do applaud you for celebrating and supporting, frankly, a very important demographic of I'm good without a bunch of employees. Well, it's it's been fun to see people come out of the woodwork and say, where have you been? Right. I don't, I'm not surprised. You know, yeah. Because there's a lot of pressure um, from all sides. You, so you need a VA. Oh, you need a team. So oh, right. you need to hire somebody. You right. Need, you know, right. And I do, you know, it's not like I do everything on my own. I do have an accountant. Sure. And I would be lost without her. Yeah. And I do have, you know, people that I can turn to for, you know. Yeah, if you need a new logo designed design. or something, you maybe aren't the best person for that. Exactly. Right. But that's just it. It's like I don't have to have an employee to do that. Right. Um. What's the name of that podcast again? Your own best company. Your own best company. Yeah. So check that out. I'm sure it's on Spotify. It's Google, everywhere all the time. All the things. Yeah. If you if you need the easiest place to find it, franklintaggart.com. Okay. Yeah. It's there. Very good. Um, we're gonna jump into our closing segment soon. Very good. Um, but I I want to go tinkle first. So oh, by all means, we'll come back. Pause. <laughs> all right, and we're back. So what I was thinking about because I always have my best ideas while I'm standing over a toilet. <laughs> was like what things are consistently challenges that make a big difference for your clients in the creative space mm -hmm. like do you have like two or three or four things that that you see that a lot of people struggle with and once they overcome it boom things happen easier well there's there's kind of like a laundry list of run-of-the-mill ailments that create a cheaper face okay one of them is imposter syndrome. Mm. Um, one of them is blocks, like creative blocks. Mm. He -he. And a lot of times, a lot of times people come to me and they've been in a role for a very long time. He. Like they've been parents for 18, 20 years. And they know that back when they were younger, that they had dreams, that they there were things that they wanted to do. Yeah. And they put they, them in the warming bin for 20 years. They'd put them off to the side. 
But what's really interesting is that when they come back to them later on, they just don't have the same meaning to them. Mm. And so they feel the loss. Right? Yeah. So one of the things that I find is that most of the folks that I work with are probably 40 and above. Okay. I do work with some people younger than that, but most of the people tend to be in their 40s, 50s, and sometimes early 60s. Yeah. And mm. a lot of them are coming into a period of their life where they've got more time freedom. Yep. And they've got, you know, some of them have just recently taken early retirement. Yep, a little financial freedom even. Yeah. And they are not sure what they want to do. They they have not, they've not had room to think about it. I need that. to do something with all these songs. For years, yeah, exactly. Or whatever, right? Yeah, I have to, you know, I've written all these songs over the last 40 years. What do I do? You know, I want to make an album. I've always wanted to have a record, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so the folks that come to me, a lot of times are in that situation where they, they've they been kind of at everybody else's beck and call for a while. Yeah. And the muscle that they have around their own desire, their yeah. own will, their own interests, all of those, the, those muscles have atrophied, yeah. right? Yeah. And so one of the things that they come to me for is to start working those muscles out again. Yeah. And it's like to start finding what okay. do I actually want yeah. what do I need and how do I get it how do I ask for it again and again in some cases what matters to me now yeah and it's not an easy path for a lot of folks it's like they're and they've they've got good ideas that, like one they they may want to have a business they may want to do music they want they may want to do that but they they can't settle on any one of them yeah yeah and so one of the things that I'm very, very keen on is that um, I think one of the things we've gotten away from, in our culture anyway, is the permission to explore. He, it's like, I think that everybody needs to have a gap year <laughs> and really explore, you know, the world, what's possible, what, what matters to you, you know? Mm -hmm. So a lot of the work that I do is in helping people to develop those muscles again. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Another thing that I find over and over and over again is I call it imposter syndrome and I, I don't even like to give it that name yeah. because that, that kind of attaches a pathology to it. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. It's like you, yes, you are an imposter. The, the, truth, yeah, the, the, the truth of the matter is, is that everybody who tries something new goes through a period of self doubt and self questioning about that at some level. Yeah. Yeah. And so, well, and people that have done things for a long time. Yeah. Right. You know, as like a business, I'm a business founder, right? Yeah. I'm a business leader and I was no CEOs and presidents that have founded their own company and run them for 20 years and have a hundred employees and they feel like an imposter too. Exactly. Right. So the thing that's really interesting is that when we come back to that, one of the things that we've got to look at is I think that that's something that's built into our psychological mechanism. Mm. Yeah. I think it's a part of a larger cycle of creativity. Mm. And it's, it's a, a part mm. of that cycle where we really wonder if what we have is legitimate, is of value, is important, all of the above. And I think that a lot of people go through that stage as a part of a larger cycle of, of finding their direction. Well, and I wonder if, or especially for those creative types, which a lot of times are those founders and things yeah. that like embracing the fact that you are this person is almost like handcuffs to not be some other person when I want to be yep. uh, in a way. So that's exactly right. And, and a lot of them will resist that because it does feel like, oh my God, this is something. No, I'm just, this is, yeah, this is serious. And this is, yeah. a, this is an actual commitment. And it's like, oh, now that I've made a commitment, I'm, I'm bound. Yeah. Do you know the, the, the motto we have around here at Local Think Tank? No. It's a uh, ask of your needs and share of your abundance. Oh, very cool. And that was my personal motto for a couple of years before I started Loco. But it's that ask of your needs is so deficient yeah. in our world. Like people don't even take the time to ask themselves what their needs are sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. They're just on autopilot. I don't know that we're allowed to, you know, it feels like that there's a kind of a social permission. Mm -hmm. It isn't there for needing. Right. You know? Right. You can want, yeah, it's a lot easier want. to ask for your wants, but I don't want to give you your wants. Yeah. 
Uh, that's your business. If you can figure out your wants, but if you got needs that I can help, yeah, I probably would if you just share them. If you even know what they are. If you know what they are. And that's part of defining it, right? That's a clarity. Exactly. That purpose. Um, so we're going to change the channel and jump over to the faith, family, politics. Cool. So we always talk about faith, family, and politics uh, as much or as little as you like and in any order that you choose. Yeah. Um, where would you like to start? Well, faith and family are kind of bound for me. Yeah, fair. Um, I'm, my great great grandfather was a Mormon pioneer. Okay, and uh, to Wyoming from Utah or from um, like Ohio Utah, or whatever to Utah from Ohio originally. And yeah, I mean, yeah, he actually started. Um, he was one of the early members of the church, and he knew both Joseph Smith and Brigham. Young. Oh wow! Okay, he worked for Brigham Young when they made it to Salt Lake. Wow! And he was a part of the Mormon battalion. So I was raised um, Mormon, okay. and I was, you know, thoroughly indoctrinated, and and I didn't have. Uh, there was nothing else that you could believe, largely. Well, what's really funny is that my mother was Episcopalian, mm. but she converted to Mormonism mm -hmm. when she married my dad. Um, I was baptized in the Episcopal Church as an infant, but mm. I had no connection with that yeah. until much yeah. later. Yeah. Um. So Mormonism was what I grew up with, and it was I grew up in a Mormon community in Wyoming. Oh, largely. those Evanstons and different places. Yeah. Like you kind of, like a lot of your friends and stuff, you weren't like looking to be accepted necessarily in these other places because you already had your own community. It was, was built in, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. I didn't realize Where, that. Wherever I went to a Mormon church, uh, there was a built-in community. Right, there. right. And so that was that like your instant friends and stuff to some yeah. extent? Like that was... Largely. Because you still go to public schools and stuff in most cases, yeah. but still your closest friends were the people from the church. Oh, yeah. We'd go to Sunday school together. Yeah, We'd yeah. go to activities together, and our families knew each other and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, when I was 15, I had a real crisis of faith, and um, a lot of it had to do with, at that time, um, people of color were not allowed to hold the priesthood. Right. And I had a real problem with that. And the other thing that I found was that I had a real problem with the way that women were treated within the culture. Mm -hmm. It was a very patriarchal, yeah, still yeah. is a very patriarchal sure. or, organization. And those things for me were ir irreconcilable. Yeah. And so I made the decision when I was probably between 15 and you 16. You were a free thinker for sure. I just was a free feeler more than anything else. Yeah, it just fair. didn't sit right. It didn't right, right. feel right to me yeah. that there were people who were secondary to others based yeah, yeah. on their gender or their color. Right. That yeah, was creepy, it's, man. It's creepy to me. <laughs> so I left that when I was 15 or 16 and um, largely found alcohol and marijuana not long after that. Which was alcohol and marijuana. Yeah, it was all good. <laughs> but I also, and music. Yeah, music was central in that, at yeah, that yeah. point. And, uh, was that an outcast thing? Like, is that a public thing where your dad was really upset? And da, da, da. He was going through trouble of his own at that time. And okay. it was just so wrapped up in his own drama and trauma that I don't even think he noticed that I left. Oh, I really? just stopped okay. going. Yeah, yeah. And our family was kind of going through a real turmoil. Point. But I knew at that point that I just couldn't tolerate that so i just kind of wandered around for a few years and when i got to college uh, i dated a girl who was a christian and for christmas the year that we were dating she gave me a bible and i had had a king james version as a mormon that was their legitimate version and right. i'd read all the book of mormon and all of that stuff yeah but she gave me a new international version and um and she, in the front of the uh, things where she signed it, yeah. she, she put something about, there was, there was a verse from John, the gospel of John, yeah. for these things are written that you may have life and have it abundantly. Yeah. And I read the gospel of John and it was like a light went on. Yeah. It's right? a good one for sure. And the thing that was compelling, and I say this a lot because mm, I don't think what you could call me now is Christian. <laughs> Fair. I still absolutely adore Jesus. Yeah, that's awesome. And I still absolutely feel and experience a closeness to God because of that 
and whatever else. He knows. It's a mystery. <laughs> so for an outsider looking in, yeah. uh, especially on the Mormon time and space, like we think about Mormons as Christians because they believe in Jesus and stuff, but obviously Jesus didn't have anywhere near the importance to your life in those earlier times than after you wrote, read the book of John. I have, I have a funny story to tell when I was four, or actually when I was younger than this. When I was going through that phase of my life, when I had an imaginary friend, fair, my imaginary friend was Jesus. Okay. And my mom recorded in my baby book that I used to like to flush the toilet and say, bye Jesus. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> The thing that's really interesting is that in Mormonism, there are different beliefs about Jesus than are any found anywhere else in Christianity. Okay. And there are some of them that they don't talk about very publicly, but one of them is that Jesus is the brother of Satan <laughs> yeah, or the brother of Lucifer. And they're both sons of God. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, is a little awkward. Yeah. And they're, they're both here established, you know, both establish and test the church. Mm, right. Interesting. So Mormonism is totally centered on the establishment of the organization. The church itself. Yeah. Right. So the, the, the founding fathers and stuff are almost more central to the doctrine and the organization than Jesus ever was. And even the current prophet is central to the doctrine right because the doctrine is something that can evolve and can change it obviously has and because they yeah. like had all the hieroglyphics translations that were a pile of baloney and stuff like that yeah it's so one of the things that's really interesting is like um the mormon church i think is an extraordinary organization yeah and i still have a lot of my own I don't want to say that my own hmm. faith is informed by it, but my own, uh, my own cultural experience is yeah, definitely yeah. informed by it. My own value of family is still informed by it. And I still have, um, just scads of admiration for my great, great grandfather and my great grand, great grandmother and the other two wives, um, who went all the way across my great, great grandfather went all the way to California first hmm. on foot. Wow. Then traversed back from California up to Idaho and then back down to Utah. Wow. And it was like all, all together, it was like 4,000 miles of walking over the course of two years. Yes. And I look at those people and it, I just admire them because they believed so strongly in what was being given to them and yeah. what was being presented yeah. to them that they were willing to uproot their lives and go, right? So that to me, there's, there's something about that faith that's compelling. My own faith has been through 72 identity crises and counting. <laughs> and I, I have to say that I've landed on the fact that the, the experience of God is a mystery to me. And it's one that I can't, I can't articulate in can't a way in that other people can understand, but I can say that whatever experience that you're having, I want you to honor that. Yeah. And I want you to go wherever that takes you. Right. Because I've been given that freedom in my life. Yeah. I've been given that ability. My mom went through her own situation where. She rediscovered the Episcopal church after many years of Mormonism and didn't look back. She said it was like coming home. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, um, I don't ascribe to any orthodoxy. Um, in fact, most of the people that I went to college with at the Christian university that I went to, um, have now become extraordinarily right wing <laughs> and extraordinarily, um, and I, I would say that, that they're very closed minded. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sad to see that because when we were in school together, that wasn't the case. Yeah, we, yeah. Were, we were able to have discussions and we, we were able to Which go I, anywhere that we wanted with those discussions. And there weren't any 
no, there weren't any doors no, to shut. Yeah, yeah. You know, well, that's one of the, I mean, in the last five or ten years, that's become increasingly difficult. Yeah, man. One of my most enjoyable things was to have challenging conversations with people that didn't. And I said, I don't even know what I believe. Yeah. A lot of times, I have two questions um, that came to mind during that discussion. One is so there's there's a phrase, a meme these days floating around that's like. There's, a, there's not two kinds of people, Democrats and Republicans. There's actually two kinds, authoritarians and libertarians. Hmm. And But what I was thinking to myself was one of the main resonances I have with the, with the Mormon church is to the extent they push back on the federal government and its yeah. overreach. But really it's because in their mind, in their doxology of sorts, they're the authoritarians, yeah. the organization of the church. And so they don't really give the federal government a stew to have as much authority as they have, but they're still not libertarians. Yeah, there can't be two authorities. Right. Yeah. And that's, to some extent, even during the COVID nation and stuff like that, it was, you know, certain Christian denominations and the Mormons were like the only little fragments of pushback against that national scope. Oh, and the the super Orthodox crazy Jews in New York. Well, yeah. I mean, that's just it. It's like (laughs) there are extremes in every every corner. And, you know, quite honestly, I'm not going to oppose the extreme as long as it doesn't impose on me. Yeah, fair. And that's the thing. It's like you are following that to its very furthest end. Yeah, as long as my liberty to, to follow or not follow Please is still in place. Please let me follow mine to my, yeah. my furthest end. Yeah. Right? Now, I'm not talking about relativism here. What I'm talking about is that each individual. Yeah, have some values and follow them too. Each individual here is having their own experience. And, you know, whatever is there, whatever that divine thing is, or what non-thing is, it is having its own expression through that person. And who am I to say, what is right or wrong about what you're going through? Yeah, yeah. All I can say is that that intuition that I had about the Mormon church and the, the secondary treatment of women and colored people. Yeah, I hate that word too. <laughs> yeah. People of color. But the Whatever. thing that the thing that I would look at is like that bothered me so much that I couldn't live with it. Yeah, yeah. And so it was like there was something there that was true that I couldn't ignore. Yeah, right. Yeah, fair. It's interesting. And yet, I know people that are still very, very confident and comfortable in their faith there. And they have to come to their own conclusions. For sure. Okay. Well, and you can still love them and feel totally. like they're great people without having them devo- denounce their beliefs or whatever. Um, the other question that really came to mind um, is like in your worship pastor service at, at Unity Church. Yeah. And to my understanding, Unity is kind of like if you're Christian, you can come. If you're Buddhist, you can come. If you're whatever, we're kind of a you know, the coexist sticker on a church, basically, right? Yeah, I, Unity is an interesting movement in that it has Christian roots. Okay. Um, but it's not specifically Christian, and, and each congregation is its own its its own mix. There's not, like, so one less central ex- organization. It's less exclusionary Christian? Is that a way to say that? Because <laughs> that's part of the DNA, kind of, or what people criticize about Christians generally is that they're exclusionary. There's... One of the things that I heard early on when I, when I took the job there was that unity isn't a place to get your questions answered. It's a place to get your answers questioned. (laughs) And I really liked that because it gave me the freedom at that point to say, you know, this is a place where I can explore and I can, and I can learn and I can, I can have a path that's not prescribed. Open discussion, exploring that path. Yeah, exactly. Right. Interesting. So, but I guess my question is, like, is there Jesus songs at the church? Because I, I sang them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are, you know, and every congregation is different. There are some yeah. that sing all the old rugged cross songs, you know. Yeah. It's like, um, in our congregation, what I said was that we had um, the best of Bill Gaither and Crosby, Stills, and Nash. <laughs> So it was like we had evangelical music in there as as much as we had, you know, popular music. Because I think there is there's a spiritual message to so much, especially music that was popular back in the sixties and seventies. 
when everybody was actually questioning those yeah, yeah. those those constructs and right? questioning it look legitimately not as a means of being popular or yeah. attracting attention but because i'm struggling with this right exactly here, right right now isn't that something yeah yeah so my favorite hymn is ripple by the grateful dead oh i love that yeah <laughs> <laughs> You got it, man. Yeah. Um, so I think I'm comfortable, almost comfortable leaving it there. Okay. If you woke up to a dream, um, where Jesus appeared to you in that dream right at the end, it was like, are you with me? Huh. And you woke up, what would you, what would you say? How could I be against you? <laughs> I like How that could answer. I? I mean, I, I, there, I just don't think. There's absolutely, I don't think there's a way that can exist yeah. that is against him. I've got plenty of ways to criticize your church yeah. or various churches that have followed you, but yeah, you Jesus are pretty cool still in my book. There's no question. I mean, I have no question the, that, that time when I was in the gospel of John for the first time with new eyes, Yeah, I fell in love with that, with that person. Yeah. That's awesome. You know, Thank and, you for sure that. and that, that has never gone away no matter what happened with the church. Yeah. Fair. Um, let's talk about your family a little bit. Okay. Um, you've mentioned your wife and your son. There yeah. was no more children. We had a father? daughter before our son was born okay. about two years before and she died at an infant. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. It was rough, but, uh, again, um, grace, grace in the midst of grief, man. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, um, a uh, wonderful and horrible experience. Yeah. How old is your son? 17 and <laughs> climbing fast. <laughs> right. He does eat a lot right now. He eats a lot and he's, he's wiser than everybody. <laughs> of course, at least <laughs> in his own perspective. <laughs> so we always do a one word description of your kids yeah. around here. You may have heard some of my podcasts in the past. Uh, do you have a word for, for yours? And what's his name? His name is Bodhi. Hey, Bodhi. Um, Bodhi, one word. Can't be hungry. Or... No, it's not that. The thing that is really, gosh, words are so limited, aren't they? Intentionally so. By design. Right. One word for Bodhi. He is a remarkable young man. Remarkable is the one. Yeah. That I'll, I'll go to. Remarkable, he yeah. remarked, is one of the things I like to write sometimes. <laughs> He's remarkable in all the best ways. You yeah. know, it's like, he he's just, a, I look at him and marvel, yeah. you know. And, and he's, he's going through all of the stuff that teenagers go through. Yep. And I wouldn't wish it any other way, but... Um, but he he navigates things in a way that he tends to land on his feet <laughs> and he tends to learn yeah and he tends to uh to come out of it without a whole lot of damage to himself and others <laughs> that's good. which is good actually that's uh that's a beautiful way that's you know, remarkable I would say that's actually <laughs> kind of my path through life in a lot of ways is <laughs> I bumped a lot against a lot of guardrails and learned a lot of things, but I haven't ever been really singed or damaged too hard. You yeah. know, it's a blessing to be able to say that. Isn't it cool? Yeah. Life's great, man. Um, faith, family, politics. Yeah. Oh, what do you want to talk about in the political realm? We just had the State of the Union address this week. Do you want to talk okay. about that? Or the Chinese spy balloon? That's been all all in the rage. Politics are weird to me. Um, I think politics are always the last to catch up. With, with what really it's needs to happen, the world, for sure. And I think that's one of the things that it's kind of built into the design is that they have to be slow to respond, um, kind of like they have to let other things happen first yeah. before before yeah political decisions. Can't send can the fire made. truck out before the fire. I don't have a well defined <laughs> political stance. Um, I will have to say that I have been in both conservative and liberal and libertarian and and all those circles all of the circles comfortable all those circles well i've found value in all of them mm. and that's the thing that i always want to put forward is like 
I think that there are always things that we need to learn from each other. Mm. And when we close the door on something yeah. else because yeah. of a belief. Cover our ears because they're stupid because obviously they believe that. I think that's to our peril. Mm. I agree. Because quite honestly, um, there, there are things that are ahead of us that no political I- ideology is ready for. Mm-hmm. It's just, there's no way that we can be fully prepared for what's ahead. And I'm going to. Are you saying ominously that? Well, no, I'm not going to say it ominously because I don't think it's ominous. I think it's just a part of our, of our collective growth and experience. I have to tell you this artificial intelligence thing to me is a huge thing that we don't even begin to have the ability to know what its impact is going to be both positive and negative. Yeah. I would agree with that. And so this seems disruption. like almost potentially as big as the internet. It's going to be bigger. Yeah. It's going to be bigger. And the thing that's really interesting is that what AI actually has the potential to do is to centralize power in one person. Right. Or a very few people. And the rest of the people are really not necessary because their labor has been replaced. <laughs> yeah. So what do we do with that? (laughs) And I don't know that, I don't know that we have the capacity to even conceive that right now. So are you saying their labor has been replaced in a physical way or more right now, at least in a theoretical way, like the writers and whatever need not apply? I don't think it's, I think it's becoming less theoretical by the day. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the best examples that we can give is that, you know, you go to any grocery store or department store now and there's a self-checkout. Right. And it used to be that when you would go to that same store, there would be two shifts of full-time employees that were working the cash right, registers. Right. And you would have interactions with them. Yep. And they were participating in the economy because they were being paid for their labor. Right. Well, what happened when those machines came along and they were, they actually did replace a significant number of those live bodies. Sure. Where did those people go in the economy? They had to go somewhere else. And most of them probably didn't have a lot of training or education. And that training and education isn't there for them yet for what, what's yeah. next. Yeah. So that has happened already. Yeah. And what we're going to see next is the scale of that is going to happen exponentially. And I don't think that there's any way in hell we can be ready for that. Hmm. I just don't think there is. So are you a gang gang? You no. Universal basic income to... I think that's a band-aid. And it's a bad band-aid to start with. Right. Because I don't they think... They just create a bunch of laziness again, and whatever. Again, what we're looking at is what is the value of currency based on? Right. There isn't a, there isn't a standard of value for it currency. It should be a life bars kind of thing. <laughs> right? Like as long as you're alive, you just get the slow, it's like passing go on Monopoly. You just get some more life bars. I don't, that's, those are questions that I just don't think yeah. that we have the answers to yet. And I think that that Yang idea is one that's going to be a stopgap measure that lasts for about a year right. before it's ineffective. Yeah, or before we're all broke. Because yeah. this whole society breaks down because people can't stand it. That some people are just sitting around. Well, what we've got to understand is that we're all going to be sitting around at some point. You maybe, know, what, maybe. What, what are our options? We don't know yet what those options are. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I'm just opening my eyes to. And it's like, I look mm. at it and I go, wow, I'm really interested to see. I'm, I think right now we're in a very exciting time because AI is actually... um a great compliment to our own abilities. Sure. It's getting smarter. <laughs> right. We're not, we're getting dumber while it's getting smarter in well, some ways. Again, I mean, if you look across the school systems and the depth of thinking, like yeah. you were talking about your wife and how she's kind of a Renaissance woman, I would consider myself a sort of a Renaissance man. You know, I garden, I motorcycle, I write poems, yeah. I do podcasts, I whatever. There ain't that many of us. The thing that's really interesting is that if we're looking at anything that can be repeated can be replaced. Hey. So then what has value? What, right. What do we base markets on? Only original thoughts need apply. 
And even then, you run out of them pretty are, soon. Are like, the original thoughts? All my original enough? thoughts are basically collaborations of different <laughs> thoughts that other people have had before me. Yeah. In a lot of ways, you know, I don't have that many original, original thoughts. My own, my own inclination at this point is that I think that there are going to be three large phases that we go through with it. And the phase that we're in right now is the first step. And mm -hmm. it's the exciting phase where we actually do see it's the, the unlock, benefits. Unlock the value. Oh my God. And it's like, just look at the things that people are doing right now with chat GPT that's only been around for a couple of months. Yeah. And how widespread that is already going. Yeah. And the things that they're able to do with that now, and they improve day by day by day by day. Yep. Things like writing advertising copy. Right. Things like, I mean, what if, what if you were to just, you know, project out a year from now and say, I would love to read a cozy mystery about a fireman in Maine. Right. And chat GPT. For sure. Generates the whole experience. Well, and like my blog, you've probably read some of my blogs in the years. Yeah. Um, I just came up with my title, which is always what I do first. Yeah. And then I write the blog. And like this title is, is all you need is love. And I bet if you put chat DTP on it and said, read all of Kurt's previous blogs and then use the title is all you need is love and make some shit up. It will do that. It would probably be amazing. Probably it, better it, than my it, shit. It will sound like you. <laughs> right. And that's the thing. It's like, it's like we're getting to the point where we can't tell the difference. Yeah. And that. That's and I don't the, even have to think at all. I just have to push go. That's the Turing test. Yeah. When we can't tell the difference between what computers do and what humans do. Yeah. No, I think we crossed it in some ways. In some ways. Oh, yeah. Easily. For sure. But that's the thing. It's like this first wave is very exciting. It's like, yeah. wow, look at what I can okay, do. Okay. So that's first wave. Second wave is. For a solopreneur, think about all the power that I have with AI as a oh, solopreneur, right. man. It's like for the next little while, I don't know how long, but for the next <laughs> little while, my possibilities have just exponentially right. grown. Yeah, yeah. That's exciting. Wow. Middle, middle stage. All of a sudden, larger and larger segments of the workforce are being removed from the workforce. Right. Be being replaced by machine learning and by tech. And one of the things that we've got to look at there is what is the critical mass as far as our economies, as far as our markets, as far as the value of anything. I mean, it might be concerned. good, actually, because we're having so few babies anymore. It'll be, it'll be a the complete you know, collapse. Maybe, but maybe <laughs> that's what we need is a cl complete collapse of the employment market to match up with our job filling ability as freaking. I don't think we're going to have jobs. I don't think jobs are a part of the far future. Mm. I think what's going to be looking, what we're going to be looking at is human beings that have complete and total time and resource freedom. And either that or the matrix. Well, yeah, that, like one of those that's two That's not things. outrageous. That's not outrageous. No, to think not it, at right? all. So the thing that I look at more than anything else with AI is that that middle stage is the part where governments are not going to be able to keep up with the change, right. the rate of change that happens and the impact that it has on actual people. There's so much power hunger though within the governments that they're not going to be able to allow that. They're going to want that. Right. They're going to want to control that. Right. And so the potential for genocide with AI. <laughs> oh yeah. Grows exponentially. Well, and well. I was just learning <laughs> about the veterinary industry from a, somebody I talked to earlier today. Yeah. Do you know that the Mars organization owns like 70% of all like the dog food and veterinary services companies yeah. in the country? They're, yeah. They're taking, I, they're holding our dogs hostage. The whole, yeah. I mean, that's just, it. it's like. And it's partly because of, AI can't take that over and dentistry too. That's why the Mormons go, like it's going to be the Mars family and the Mormons, <laughs> like being dentists and freaking veterinarians. It's going to succeed against the Terminator. <laughs> Well, I think the third okay. stage, okay. getting we'll past, go there. All right. getting past that middle stage, Sorry. which I got stuck there. You know, if you want to, if if you want, if you want me to tell you what I think the great tribulation that's talked about in the Bible is going to yeah. be, yeah, I think it's that it's middle that. stage. Okay. Yeah. The third stage is going to be when, when it's all integrated, and we have adapted to, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. This Neuralink style. I have a feeling though, my own intuition is that 
what we're going to be about as humans is that spiritual exploration is going to be about the only thing that we have left except for the exploration of space as people. Hmm. They can send probes. Well, why would you and, do that? Yeah. Right. Like you, you should be able to power what, probes what, to what, somewhere. You should what listen. use does it have? Right. Well, I guess, but you can leave a library behind or something. I don't know. So, uh, Lex Friedman talked to some dude just a couple of days ago for five hours. And if you haven't listened to that one yet, it's a good one. Uh, I'll have to check it out. Yeah. It's solid. Yeah. You're leaving us on a kind of a downer here. I'm going to, I'll, I'll pick us up here. Okay. Right. So your local experience is your crazy experience of your lifetime that you're willing to share. Crazy experience of my lifetime. Oh my gosh. Crazy good, crazy bad, moment, day, week. Oh. Mm -hmm. You stumped me, man. You don't have one? My loco experience. I have a whole life full of that. <laughs> my whole life has been a loco experience. <laughs> it's different than most. I will say that. It has been absolutely bonkers, man. And I couldn't have ever predicted this and I couldn't have ever planned it. You know, it is it is that ludicrous. Um, I If I were to have to point at one thing, the one thing that I look back on and just say, um, I'm not sure if that's really me is that I was actually named the consultant of the year for the SBDC in 2020. No, oh, I remember that. I was, it's like, you made a lot of impact. Well, I made a lot of impact, but it's like, it's, I'm just this little niche guy. Whatever. I'm just, yeah, I'm just yeah, a, whatever dumbass from Wyoming. Well, that's like, imposter syndrome you know, right there. That's well, imposter syndrome. The thing syndrome. that's really interesting though, is like, I, I look at it as like, it may be imposter syndrome. Maybe, but quite honestly, when they, when they said that I was the guy, I went, oh, they didn't tell you ahead of time. No, <laughs> cool. I didn't know. I had no idea until we were in the zoom meeting. It was during the pandemic. Right. Right. In the zoom meeting, they, they were going and I was, I was doing something else. I was right. like, you're like, what? <laughs> doing my phone or filing my nails or something like that. And they said, Franklin Taggart. And I thought, Franklin, have I done here with this? Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Well, I think it was worthy because you definitely invested in a whole lot of conversations. And, yeah, man. Uh, could I ask, like, as a curious point, because some people have answered it that way, like, what's your perspective on local think tank as somebody that's kind of adjacent yeah. to and seen it evolve over all these years? Like, where am I fucking it up? Where, where are we doing good? Like, well, I've seen, I've seen your organization grow and evolve over the years and it's been exciting to see i mean your vision has been you know your vision has been a really good driver but i think one of the things that i'm going to hang my hat on um, first time i met charlie hmm. charlie talked about the think tank and he said i wish i would have had that when i started in business yeah. And I think that that to me is the strongest testimonial chart at 50 years in retail. Yeah. And he said, I wish I would have had this the first year I was in business. Yeah. That to me said enough. Yeah. You know? Well, if you listen to this one, Charlie Morris, you're awesome. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't seen Charlie in ages. Yeah, I well, they moved to it. Arizona oh. about three years ago. There's a, there's an awesome video of the hot rod that he and his son built and they oh, took man. Him first place in the good guys national car show and they're like their third show yeah so anyway well bless yeah. you charlie i miss you i appreciate that that's a that's a good sentiment of like the diversity of people that it appeals to yeah yeah well thanks franklin cool. the franklin this has been a lot of fun Chris. has been here yeah i appreciate it you enjoyed it and uh if people want to look you up they should go to just FranklinTaggart.com. FranklinTaggart.com is the easiest way Everything's to Everything's found from there. It's my blog. It's my only blog, and it's the blog. And it's got everything else on it about me. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much. We'll see you next time. Perfect.